In England, and here in Wales where I live, there are many surviving examples of medieval social display all around us. Much of it we take for granted, especially what we see in our built heritage, the castles, parish churches, ruined monasteries, and so forth. We see the stained glass, or the monumental brass, or the heraldic device, and admire the aesthetic quality, but normally do not stop to consider, but what does it mean? What did the person who spent a considerable sum of money for this object intend to convey to the onlooker? In this film, we will be considering the propaganda value of social display in the late Middle Ages. Central to this theme will be heraldry, heraldic devices, and badges, as they were used in livery, coinage, stained glass, effigial monuments, and the like. But for the benefit of those of us who don't know much about heraldry, Connor will give us a quick lesson on heraldry and its meaning. Heraldry was born on the battlefield as a way of telling who was who in the clash and confusion of combat. If the first daring charge failed to sweep the opposing force from the field, then the combat would inevitably break down into smaller, swirling melees. Where knowing friend from foe could not only mean the difference between life and death, but the difference between a crushing defeat and a glorious victory. To the modern mind, it's difficult to conceive the coming together of two such armies, each possibly numbering thousands of men. But Heraldry played a crucial role in maintaining at least a trace of order at a time when it was at a premium. The development of heraldry was intertwined with the development of a chivalric culture amongst the nobility and formed an intrinsic part in its evolution. Over time, heraldry became something more than simply a battlefield device. It was the product of a culture founded on the concept of military service, and where that service often marked you as a man of standing, especially if you could bring your own retinue along with you. Thus, heraldry came in itself to demonstrate that one had a certain standing in society. What drove this shift in purpose was the development and expansion of the tournament scene. The original form of knightly contest in the tournament was not the joust, but the melee, a form of mock battle that saw fighters compete in teams or a free-for-all. Heraldry served to allow spectators to identify individual combatants. Heraldry as an art form was, li was thus likely to grow and expand as long as the tournament scene existed. To some extent, one could argue that developments in armour also influenced the rise of heraldry. As armour became ever more concealing, evolving from the fairly simple male armour into the full plate armour that almost completely hid the wearer away in a steel shell that came into usage in the second quarter of the 15th century. This development also altered the manner in which heraldic devices were displayed. Whereas the origins lay on the banners and seals of the nobility, as time passed, shields and surcoats became the primary platforms, indicating a definitive shift away from the group combat of the medieval battlefield and into the sphere of the duel and small-scale tournament fighting. The tournament, however, was not the end of heraldry's evolution. From the 13th century onwards, it increasingly became part of the fabric of elite society. Not only did heraldry signify one station, it was in many instances a requisite part of that station. Such development was driven by the expansion of the profession of heralding, which helped to codify and set up a group of conventions and rules that by and large were followed to some extent across Europe. The most obvious example of this codification is the taking hold of the idea that the heir of a title should be the one to inherit the arms of his father, whilst the other siblings would have to come up with variants of the parental arms. Thus a link was established and maintained for the title itself. As heraldic devices became more and more common, their complexity increased as well. Whereas the early designs had been simple, as the years passed designs became increasingly elaborate, displaying the owner's own personal stature and wealth and illustrating that heraldry had become more of a declaration of power and status than solely a tool to be used on the battlefield. By the late 14th century, heraldry was no longer simply a symbol of status, belonging exclusively to the aristocracy and nobility, but something that for many esquires, members of the emerging gentle order, demonstrated that one had grasped the lowest rungs of elite society. This is true to such an extent that even those who lay outside the military sphere of society, such as the merchants, took to commissioning their own heraldic devices, Dr. David Simpkin argues that it's only natural that they should wish to adopt martial trophies that were so celebrated by their social superiors. In other words, heraldry was a way one could be associated with the all-important martial culture that dominated England and her neighbours in the late medieval era without actually taking part in it. One acquired at least a part of the nobility and status of the knightly classes without having to have been effectively born in the purple. 
One of the manners in which this could be achieved was to wear a variation of your liege lord's hered heraldry in order to siphon some of his power and prestige. Somewhat ironic then, as more people outside the landed gentry were under the idea of heraldry in order to associate with the military classes, they actually pushed heraldry further and further away from a purely military art form. In effect, heraldry was a way to fit in to a culture that exalted the warrior and cherished martial endeavour, a culture that was in many ways perpetuated by the Hundred Years' War, which had arguably militarised English society and drew more and more people into the martial culture in order to support the wars in France. During the late medieval period, which saw large numbers of men granted the right to bear arms, not only owing to the repeated military campaigns of successive kings, but also to the rise of the gentry class beginning in the late 14th century, it is perhaps inevitable that conflicts would arise regarding the usage of similar or identical heraldic devices. The first reference to the court of chivalry can be dated to 1346. Its origins lay in the changing warfare of the campaigns of Edward III. As time passed, Edward came to increasingly rely not upon feudal levies, but upon bands of soldiers under contract to an aristocratic captain, who would in turn contract with the king. Such contracts often covered, for instance, the division of spoils, the rights to shares and prisoner ransoms, and terms of service. In the event of disputes over such contracts occurring in foreign lands, and thus beyond the jurisdiction of England's common law courts, they were instead referred by the king to a court presided over by two of his highest ranking military officers, the Lord High Constable and the Lord Marshal. How the court came to have jurisdiction over issues of heraldic disputes can be seen in a definition of the court's jurisdiction by the House of Commons in 1389. The Commons declared the court to have cognizance of contracts touching deeds of arms and war out of the realm, and also of things that touch arms and war within the realm, which cannot be determined nor discussed by common law. The term arms in this case did not refer merely to heraldic arms, but more generally to matters of chivalry. For instance, the law of arms, often practiced by the court, referred to the 14th century to customary rules accepted as regulating the relations between soldiers, knights, men at arms with one another in wartime. It was for this reason that the presiding officers of the court were typically nobles with a strong military background and experience, who would be aware of such customs rather than those with training in the law. The matters of heraldic disputes were included in the court's jurisdiction, offers an insight into how heraldry was perceived at the time. Whilst the practical use of heraldry to identify an individual should not be overlooked, it was much more importantly a matter of personal honour. One account describes a meeting in 1405 between Sir Don Gallenrig and John Green Esquire. When Gallenrig saw Green in arms that he considered his own, he immediately demanded that the matter be settled by combat without delay. The late Morris Keane concluded that the readiness of martial men to risk their lives in combat over a set of arms they believe themselves entitled to is a very clear sign of their sense of chivalrous honour, and was inextricably bound up with their right and their family's right to their coat. As heraldic arms were typically expected to be displayed in a martial context, disputes were thus expected to be decided by martial men under the law of arms, and were therefore adjudicated by the court of chivalry. Their importance demonstrates the immense value of heraldry to the nobility, as a sign of both personal and family honour and standing. Whilst the court of chivalry had the last word in disputes concerning coats of arms, badges were not regulated by the constable's court. Badges, personal signs often using figures borrowed from heraldic arms, had their origins in the 12th century, but were not in general use until at least the 1320s. Perhaps the earliest known badge was the Plantagenista broomsprig of Geoffrey, Count of Anjou and progenitor of the Plantagenet dynasty. Other well-known badges of the 14th century would include the ostrich feathers of the Black Prince and the swan badge of the House of Lancaster, developed in response to the increasing complexity of heraldic symbolism. Some of the earliest surviving evidence of the use of badges, along with livery and uniforms, is from the Scottish campaigns during the Regency years of Edward III's minority. Throughout the 1330s and 1340s, Edward's heraldic leopards appeared on the king's war attire and battle standards in his campaigns in Scotland and on the continent, and he cultivated the use of the device in a variety of ways as a personal symbol in a much more systematic way than any of his forebears. The leopards became increasingly prominent on successive versions of the Great Seal, 
and he was the first English king to incorporate the leopard in the design of coins. From the mid-1340s, the florin, half-florin, and quarter-florin all contained an image of a leopard, the half-florin even being nicknamed the leopard. But the use of the badge as a symbol of politics and propaganda was not the exclusive province of King Edward. It was probably the contact between the rival courts during the Hundred Years' War that led to the increasing use of the badge in France. And in England, the use of the badge cannot be disassociated from the practice of livery and maintenance, by which the great lords and magnates were able to outfit their retainers with clothes, hoods, or badges that would identify them as belonging to a particular nobleman's faction or affinity. From the 1360s on, Badges were hung as pendants from livery collars, bands of leather or velvet decorated with devices usually composed of silver, silver gilt, or gold, and worn about the neck by men of esquire or wealthy merchant rank and above. The more common badges, bands, robes, or caps were distributed to men of a lesser station. When worn by substantial numbers, such livery could present a dramatic visual expression of political force. Livery, especially badges, were employed for political purposes at both the local and national level. At the Shire level, bands of local yobs would conduct themselves like mafiosi in the belief that their lord's badge granted them immunity from prosecution and proceeded to attack opponents and destroy their property. At the national level, badges entered the political fray in the reign of King Richard II, who sought to create his own royal affinity. Richard's white heart badge became a lightning rod for Lancastrian persecution in the usurpation of 1399. One of Richard's household esquires, Hanako D'Artasso, was imprisoned in Chester Castle for refusing to remove his collar of the white heart and submit to the Duke of Lancaster. During the Wars of the Roses, the intermittent political crises and armed conflict between the competing dynastic houses of Lancaster and York witnessed a considerable uptick in the practice of propaganda. A particularly eye-catching Yorkist genealogy was produced in the late 1460s or shortly thereafter, which very likely was used for public display to a restricted viewership, who would have seen depicted Edward IV's lineal descent from English, French, and Spanish rulers. And among all the colorful shields, banners, badges, mottos, and scriptural quotations, was a prominent depiction of the attributed arms of Brutus, the legendary founder of Britain. Propaganda was aided in the late 15th century by the spread of literacy and the introduction of the printed word. Richard III used propagandist proclamations in order to reach larger audiences for the impugning of his enemy's reputation. When Richard was expecting an imminent invasion by the exiled Henry Tudor, he issued an abusive proclamation asserting that Tudor, in league with the French king, would renounce the claim to the French throne and exclude forever the arms of France from those of England. Richard's detractors also were not above character assassination. William Collingborn's well-known lampoon was posted across London the month before Tudor landed at Milford Haven. The cat, the rat, and Lovell, our dog rule all England under a hog. The hog referred to Richard's white boar badge. The cat was Sir William Catesby's spotted cat symbol. The rat was Sir Richard Ratcliffe. And the dog referred to Viscount Lovell's wolf crest. Professor Michael Hicks surmises that the rhyme attributes great authority to Richard's lieutenants of lowly rank, ridicules them, and maybe even hints at the bestiality of their rule. It got Collingborn executed for treason, but it was such an effective piece of potent political propaganda that the chroniclers failed to mention the charge of treason and only recorded the rhyme. At a local and family level, heraldic devices and badges were used by the nobility to promulgate status and lordship. Careful and pretentious juxtaposition of personal symbols amongst those of famous forebears, distinguished relatives, powerful neighbors, or even royal personages could broadcast important political messages. Gatehouses, parish churches, 
Stained glass, monumental brasses, and tombs were decorated with arms, badges, and mottos, all proclaiming various messages of local presence, power, honor, grandeur, lineage, loyalty, and even dynastic and political alliances. While walking southwards along the main street of Warkworth in Northumberland, one would have to be willfully ignorant not to comprehend the message of the Percy's great rise to power seen in the massive Percy lion set in the north wall of the keep overlooking the town below. The lower orders, particularly urban dwellers, understood the significance of such symbols. Lavish displays of royal, national, civic, and celestial heraldry in prominent places would have appealed to a growing sense of national and civic pride, royal authority, and divine approval. But political symbolism of this sort did not always find favor with the common man in the street. Professor Nigel Saul reminds us in his biography of Richard II that Londoners hostile to Richard's match with Anne of Bohemia tore down the displayed arms, not only of the king, but also his father-in-law, as the young couple processed through the city. And townsmen were quick to pick up on the changing winds of fortune and could quickly change political allegiances. After the Duke of York fell in battle at Wakefield, Beaufort portcullises began appearing on London houses on the chance that the Lancastrian army of Henry Beaufort should enter the city. And when Perkin Warbeck was staying in Antwerp in 1494, two Englishmen in the city unsuccessfully attempted to throw a pot of muck over the pretender's assumed arms displayed on the house where he was lodged. Such responses highlight the fact that even as the medieval period was approaching its twilight, heraldic arms, badges, and banners were much more than meaningless, albeit colorful, marks of identification. They were instruments of political propaganda, which could evoke various emotional responses, declare possession, presence, and authority, stimulate a sense of national pride, promote local standing, and be wielded as weapons of misrepresentation and distortion. And in a certain sense, are there modern variants not being put to similar usage even in our own day? When one thinks of medieval churches, one often imagines great Gothic spires, high vaulted ceilings, magnificent carvings, and of course rows of beautiful stained glass windows. While stained glass had been known in England from within a century of the Anglo-Saxon conversion to Christianity, it was not until the late 12th century that its usage became common within the great cathedrals of England, and perhaps a generation still until it was commonly seen within parish churches. However, it is easy to understand the profound impression they were likely to have on the countless numbers who saw them. Even today, the magnificent windows of the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, or Canterbury Cathedral, are rightly admired for their incredible standards of craftsmanship and the sheer visual impact they leave upon those who see them. How much greater then might such an impact have been upon the medieval peasant or town dweller who unlike modern viewers would scarcely see such colour in their day-to-day -day lives? Stained glass windows therefore offered a method of spreading a message to a large audience. Churches were after all attended by the vast majority of the medieval population and in visiting such a church it is next to impossible to ignore the features of stained glass. The medieval church made effective use of stained glass for both temporal and spiritual purposes. The expense of stained glass offered a way for a particular parish or diocese to demonstrate its wealth. Indeed, this is why cathedrals, being the seat of a bishop and a focal point for the church's wealth, were able to install stained glass windows before smaller parish churches could do so. Such cathedrals would have also had a larger number of people to see the windows, from the population of the town or city in which they were built, to the pilgrims who would travel to see these great houses of God. Yet they also served to depict biblical scenes to a population who would have been largely unable to understand the Latin in which the Bible was written, or otherwise altogether illiterate in the vernacular. Stained glass thus allowed the church to impart biblical messages and stories into the population, whilst at the same time increasing the splendor and renown of their own churches and cathedrals. Yet the church was not alone in wanting to impart its message through these windows. 
Whilst much of the original stained glass of the medieval period has been destroyed over the centuries, the Great East Window of Gloucester Cathedral is a spectacular example of a largely intact medieval stained glass window. Dating from the 1350s, when it was the largest stained glass window in the world, the window depicts numerous saints and holy scenes as one would expect, yet the lowest row of glass, closest to the people who would be viewing it, are not saints, but rather a steady row of 14 heraldic memorials. Whilst not all are original, 19th century stained glass historian Charles Winston identified that only 10 were original arms, those of the Black Prince, the Earls of Lancaster and Arundel, Lord Barclay, the Earls of Warwick and Northampton, and Pembroke, Lord Talbot, Sir Maurice de Barclay, and Thomas Lord Bradston. And all, all of these are in situ, except those of the Black Prince and the Earl of Lancaster. The arms of Edward III were likely one of the originals destroyed. Winston further notes that the window was likely designed in either 1347 or 48. It's essential to note that all those whose arms were featured played important roles in Edward III's French campaign, which culminated in the spectacular victory at Crecy in 1346. The window is therefore not only portraying a strong religious message, it's a monument to those who participated in Edward III's successful French campaigns in the 1340s. Interestingly, several of those portrayed were not perhaps the most important of the campaign, but each had a connection with the county of Gloucestershire. For instance, the Earl of Pembroke owned several estates in the neighbouring Welsh marches, while Lord Talbot owned a manor in the county. We can therefore see that the stained glass windows were not only used by the church to convey a spiritual message, but they could be used by the nobility, both those with local influence such as Lord Barclay, and more powerful men on the national stage such as the Black Prince. With a large audience they were likely to attract, owing to their location within churches and cathedrals, it isn't hard to see the potential value of churches as areas of visual propaganda. Monumental brasses are not the passive, inarticulate objects suggested by their appearance. No, indeed, they were contributors to a discourse. They perform various functions. First, brasses, much like the more expensive carved alabaster stone effigies, provided a focus for rituals of commemoration, which is why so many include the words orate pro anima, pray for the soul of. Second, they were a link between the living and the dead. And last, and for our purposes most importantly, brasses were integral to the strategies of legitimation by which families affirmed their position within elite society. Of all the various functions of monumental brasses, the desire to secure intercession was most important. However, considerations of status and display were always and increasingly a major role in commemoration. The fact that an individual could afford commemoration was itself indicative of status because graves of the poor were simply left unmarked. Once the use of effigial monuments became widespread from about the fourth decade of the 13th century, potential for display was greatly increased. The commemorated could manipulate their self-image. Lineage and social connections could be advertised through heraldic display, the wearing of badges and collars, the inclusion of occupational symbols by wealthy merchants, etc. The natural inclination is to attribute the rapid growth in the post-1360 trade in brasses to changes in the pattern of demand after the devastation of the Black Death. Living standards improved. Lesser landowners could sometimes move a rung or two up the ladder. Half effigies began to appear in greater numbers as the civilian subgentry desired commemoration for themselves. Certain social or occupational groups became prominent clients of the brass atelier. These included Cotswold wool merchants, lawyers, and university academics. Most commissions for monumental brasses were placed by the executors of the will of the individual to be commemorated shortly after his or her death. Some, however, were commissioned by the commemorated while yet living. One well-known example of this type of commissioning was that ordered in 1367 by John Lord Cobham while he was still a young man. He is depicted in brass holding a model of the Chantry College which he had founded at Cobham with an engraved epitaph 
or a border that combined pride in his foundation with acceptance of his mortality. But for the majority of commissions which were placed by executors, Professor Nigel Saul wonders how much of the conception of the brass was fashioned in the thinking of the executors as opposed to that of the testator. No two people will have the exact same tastes, but executors would have known and sympathized with the commemorated well enough to generally conform to the tastes of the deceased. Very few commissions were expected to result in an individual likeness of the commemorated, but what was expected was for the person to be represented in the proper pecking order of society, in armor, in religious garb, or in civilian attire. But individualized decoration beyond attire was another means of announcing one station. The second estate were keen to include shields emblazoned with the arms of near kin, such as parents or spouses, or even of close associates. Crown servants might even try to bask in the glory of their lord, the king, by including the royal arms. Badges were used to declare one's political affiliations, a bow and swan, a Stafford knot, a Berghirsch fork-tailed lion, a Lancastrian SS collar, or a Yorkist collar of suns and roses. Religious imagery could be included to articulate piety and devotion. As time passed, inscriptions grew ever longer. Simple requests for prayer were not elaborate enough. Dates of death were added to help in annual remembrance. Good works were noted. Genealogies would mention distinguished ancestors, all in an effort to enhance the family's repute. In light of the surviving evidence, one might be entirely reasonable in arguing that brasses and tombs were used as a source for the ambitions and concerns of those commemorated. Such ambitions and concerns could sometimes be sounded in the memorials. Nigel Saul conducted an in-depth study of the monuments of the extended Cobham family and published his findings in 2001 in Death, Art, and Memory in Medieval England and found that the memorials of the senior branch at Cobham and those of the cadet branch at Sturborough communicated different messages. The memorials at Cobham and Kent emphasized lineage and continuance of the family line due to this line facing dynastic extinction. Their Sturborough cousins monuments at Lingfield and Surrey, however, emphasized status and position. Reginald, First Lord Cobham of Sturborough, Knight of the Garter, had been a successful war captain in the Cressy and other campaigns, and through this had been able to establish his family among the peerage of England. His heirs were unable to live up to his legacy, and their monuments reflect a family keen to trumpet the position that they were trying to maintain as they gradually slipped back into the gentry rank. Heraldry is much more prominent at Lingfield than at Cobham, even to the extent that the brass of the first wife of Reginald III displays a square banner indicating banneret status. The greatly oversized tomb of her husband was exceedingly disproportionate to his importance. It was a case of lost social status being overly compensated for by grandiose funerary commemoration. What the study of such a series of commemorative memorials indicates is that identity of the family takes precedence over identity of the individual. A commemorated individual occupies one slot, as it were, in a genealogical sequence. Paul Binsky, a professor of medieval art history, posits that in late medieval funerary commemoration, it is in group rather than in individual terms that selfhood is constructed. The images and text on the memorial were arranged to position the commemorated within a system that linked the living and the dead in a relationship of mutual dependence. There was a time when medieval social display was regarded as only being of interest to antiquarians and the consideration of some art historians. But this film has demonstrated that the social display of the late Middle Ages is worthy of every bit of the attention it has gathered from some prominent medieval social historians, 
particularly as it pertains to propagandist applications. Heraldry evolved from its utilitarian purposes on the battlefield into a vehicle of exhibiting successful social climbing amongst the gentry class. It became so intertwined with personal and familial honor that the chivalric culture of the time required some of the highest ranking noblemen in the land to adjudicate heraldic disputes. On the surface, badges perhaps appear as rather benign personal marks of identification, but in reality were tailor-made as instruments of political propaganda, positively promoting one's own family's interests, or negatively opposing the interest of one's enemies. Coupled with the livery and maintenance system, they could exert a powerful political presence at both local and national level. It seems that no aspect of social display was immune from propagandistic purposes, even stained glass and monumental brasses yielding their primary religious teaching and commemorative usages to attendant secondary needs of elite society for individual and familial promotion. So the next time you visit a medieval castle or cathedral, Think about the messages for public consumption incorporated within the visual display. It will enrich your experience.